Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year to you, in case you're wondering, it is me. Uh, if Paul had had access to video, that's what he would have done. He would have given us something which looked, I think, just like that and told with the same passion that was in that video because he grasped the cosmic significance and sense of God's creation and God's plan and God's desire and God's passion that no one should be left behind. So here we have some scaffolding, a nice romantic image to begin the new year, and it's Robin Hood's Bay last week. Uh, what do you use scaffolding for? To hold things up. What else do you use it for? To, to build, to rebuild. Yes, get access to tall play. Use scaffolding to reach what you couldn't otherwise reach to do something that you couldn't otherwise do. Scaffolding is essential. And that's why at the beginning of Ephesians, Paul gives us some essential scaffolding that we need if we're going to understand what he wants us to believe and do and be. So if we could have the next one, Ken, please. So the scaffolding of faith that Paul gives us in this first 12 verses of Ephesians begins with God. Paul wants us to get God right. It's really essential that we do and that we get God right with the enthusiasm that Paul has got. And so as you can see, he pours out this fantastic poem of God's love. Now, do you remember when you first sent a love letter, or these days a love text, or a love email, or a love WhatsApp, or a Facebook love post? Do you, know? do you remember the old-fashioned way when we used to write, using our hands on something called paper? Do you remember sending a love letter to the light of your life? Do you remember doing that, some of you? How did that feel? Obviously, yes, indeed, it did. It felt... You hoped you'd get one back? You felt... A, a pragmatist as ever, Shirley. You felt better getting one back because it was vulnerable, wasn't it? You, you're telling somebody you love them. I can remember sending love letters to you, Susie, didn't I? Do you remember? She's nodding and smiling, so she obviously does. But that was, you know, it's quite something. You put your heart on the line. You make yourself vulnerable and you're actually sharing what matters most to you. And that's what Paul is doing here. This is a, a love letter about God and God's love and how Paul feels about God. So the first bit of scaffolding we need to get right if we are to be the people who can do what Paul says we need to do is get God right. And look what he says God is like. God is a God who blesses us in Christ, chooses us, destined us, who pours out the good pleasure of his will upon us. This is passion poured out, unreserved passion about who God is. And Paul is absolutely insistent, we've got to get God right. Wow, we are blessed and chosen through the good pleasure of his will, to live to the praise of his glorious grace and the riches of his grace that he's lavished upon us. Good pleasure freely bestowed on us, the beloved. You get the sense he's not holding back, is he? This is a good love letter, isn't it? Don't you think there's all the passion there? There's all the feeling there? I mean, look at the adjectives. Look at what he's saying about who and how God is is so what's god like for you is god like this in your understanding says paul is this how god feels about you is this about how god yearns for you and has a passion for you and god's desire for you paul says this actually is the truth get this right everything else will fall into place 
that in Jesus, God has given us everything he's got to give. He's held nothing back. He's poured out all of his love in Jesus for you and for me. Freely bestowed, lavished, chosen, blessed. That's the sort of God God is. Next one, Ken, if you would. So if that's true of God, Paul says, okay, the next bit of scaffolding you've got to get right is the church is you and me. And look what he says about the church, about us. He says that we are going to be full of grace and peace and blessed with every spiritual blessing. We are going to be holy and blameless. Do you feel holy and blameless? In this new year, anybody feel holy and blameless? Or have you already junked the resolutions? Have they already gone out of the window? Indeed, that was a knowing. I know that sound. That is a knowing. <laughs> uh, I'm busted. But holy and blameless is what God wants us to be. Because God has adopted us. Now, this is Paul's great passion. You remember in the, the video which we saw explaining Ephesians, those arms out wide, nobody left out, everybody included. We are all adopted. We are welcomed by God. He wants us to be holy and blameless. We wa he wants us to be filled with spiritual blessings, a place that's full of grace and peace. That's how we understand this church. It's why, as stewards, we chose Ephesians. Because it helps us get God right and understand what God wants from us. That we should be a place where everybody feels included. Because this is a place where we know what it is to be redeemed through the sacrifice of Jesus and to be forgiven of all that we have done wrong and have gotten wrong. Right at the heart of his understanding of church, there is this beautiful outpouring, his passion and understanding, his focus on what happened at Easter. That we are forgiven, we are set free. There is love in its fullness for us. And more that the church is a place where the mystery of God's will is understood and is practiced and is embraced because we have an inheritance this is our purpose, that we might live for the praise of his glory. It's not a bad love letter, is it? Just look at what he's packed into 12 verses. Look at what he said about God. Look at what he's saying about the church and us. And he says it for one very simple reason, I think. Is that unless God is like that for us, and unless we know ourselves loved like that by God, how on earth can we begin to love somebody else and love other people? At the outset of Ephesians, Paul is saying, get this scaffolding in place if you are really, truly going to do what I need you to do in the world. If you really want to do my mission, you've got to get God right, get yourself right. Know that you are loved, cuddled and fed, held close, cherished, nourished. That's what Paul is saying we should have as our experience as church. Because how on earth can we hold and cherish and nourish others unless we've been nourished ourselves? That's why this matters so much. Because for Paul, the purpose of the church is really, really clear. And it's, it's there in this phrase, in the middle of this text, the purpose of the church is mission. To gather up all things in him, that's what Paul says is our guiding purpose, our sole reason for being. And in order to do that, in order to be a church and a people in the world who welcome, who gather, who invite, who bring, who love, who cherish, who wish others to be set free and liberated from oppression and heartache, we have to know God's love and we have to let that love change us. Only then can we be this church of purpose. And the video we saw 
had that purpose writ clear, didn't it? From the heart of creation, right to you and me, God's purpose is to invite, to bring together all people that they could be set free in Christ themselves. Because that's how the story of Jesus begins, isn't it? If you think about it. As today is Epiphany, and it's the last Sunday of the holy season of Advent and Christmas, today we remembered the wise men, who are the symbol and the archetype, if you like, of those who don't belong, those who are beyond, those who are strangers, who are welcomed in and become part of this fantastic story of grace and love and acceptance and freedom and liberation. The Magi are drawn by God to Jesus, just as the shepherds had been drawn by God to Jesus. The God who begins with those on the outside and draws them in to his passion and his love. So this first 12 verses of Ephesians help us to get God right, help us to understand who God wants us to be as church and give us a clear purpose to gather up all things in him. To God 